Good afternoon out there, everybody. Good morning, wherever you may be. Thanks for making us part of your day. We're super excited to have another episode of GMS Live here, our second of 2023. And once again, we're joined by a couple final four coaches from the University of Pittsburgh. You see them up there on the top of your screen. Last week, we had coaches from uh, Texas. Next week, we'll have coaches from Louisville. But today, it's all about Pitt. And we're going to be talking about what uh, helped them advance to the Final four for the second consecutive year. Head coach is Dan Fisher, top left of your screen. Uh, associate head coach now, recently named associate head coach, Kellen Patron in the top right of your screen. Uh, Dan, congratulations on a great season. Thanks for making time to be with us here today. Yes, thanks for having us, and uh, hopefully this is a good conversation. Well, it's one that I've been looking forward to for at least a year because – um, we talked, we've been talking a little bit about your six, two offense and some of the shows we've been doing with Courtney Thompson. And, and, uh, so I've actually told Courtney, we need to get down on one of these shows. So, uh, we made it happen finally. And Kellen, you're in your 10th year up there at Pitt. Yeah. Uh, excited to be here with you guys today and, um, excited that, uh, good chat with you. Okay. All right. We're going to get to some X's and O's in just a second. But first, we want to let you all know out there that uh, if you want one of these Stanley Cup water tumblers, uh, go ahead and throw hashtag GMS Plus into the comment section and uh, we'll do a drawing at the end of the show and we'll get one of these sent out to you. But um, it's an awesome tool. And then uh, also uh, check out our coaching clinic camp schedule. We're going to be from coast to coast, as you can see there, from Moraga, California, all the way out to Boston and a lot of places in between. Uh, check out goldmedalsquared.com for uh, more information about joining us at uh, at one of these camps. My name is Dave Neely. I'm coming at you from Provo, Utah. Mike Wall uh, from Scottsdale, Arizona. Mike, you, re you uh, survived the rowdy golf tournament out there last weekend? Everyone's gone. <laughs> the Super Bowl and the golfers. Everyone's gone. So <laughs> life is There bad. we go. Yeah. Now it's all about volleyball. So um, we, uh, we're we going to start by asking all of you out there a question. And, and please throw these into the comments section so we can kind of scroll through the comments and see what you guys are doing out there. But um, curious to see what offensive system you're running right now. If you're coaching a club team, are you doing a 6-2, a 5-1? What do you like to do with your high school teams? What do you like to do with your, uh, with your club teams? And because... Uh, there's lots of different options, and we know that lots of uh, good high school programs and club programs are running uh, different systems. Dan, let me ask you this question. The last couple of years, uh, you've made it to the Final Four, two straight years. How would you call your offensive system? What are you guys doing over there? Um, good question. I, I think <laughs> uh, we used to be known for playing really fast, and you know, there's been – there's been years that we've been in a 5-1, we've been in a 5-2. Um, I think our offensive system is we want to play fast, but, you know, the last couple of years we've had to slow it down. And because we want to, to win. <laughs> and, you know, we are, the way we look at um, our offense is, um, you know, how many times out of 10 or how many balls out of 100 are we able to hit the ball really hard? And so we want to be uh, a team that if we tip, it's because we want to, not because we have to. So we're just trying to maximize how many times we can hit high and hard with range. Where's the, Dan, where's the inflection, or Kellen, where's, where's the inflection point or how are you guys determining this is too fast and it's, it's the inflection point. We've met it. We need to slow it down and uh, dial things back a little bit. 
I mean, we're, we're constantly looking at uh, like how in rhythm our hitters are, and we experiment. I don't know if we have a particular staff, but it also is just a somewhat of a conversation with our athletes as well, where we're just feeling what they're most comfortable with. And you know, with someone like Courtney Bazzario, who we didn't have a ton of time with, um, we did. We started off with our system, and then just as we went, we saw, hey, she's a little bit more effective on a higher set. Yeah, and that's that's probably been the main thing is we've had some very good transfers recently that um, that we didn't have an off season to work with, and so it just we get we were deep in the season. We we have a month and a half left, and we're looking at the numbers, saying, "Hey, the ball passed the ten foot line. We're going high in transition." Nice. All right, we got uh, we got some comments coming in, Richard, six two because my. Sp- Setters are my best passers also. Uh, Luke says 5-1 in club, 6-2 in high school. Uh, Andy says 6-2 is awesome and with 11 players. Um, 6-2 lefty with beautiful hands uh, from Luke. So, um, Dan and Kellen, we're going to dive a little bit into your 6-2 offense. But uh, first, I want to look at some of your rotations and have you break some of these down for us. Um, Here's your rotation one. Uh, against Florida here in the Sweet 16. And um, this is just pretty standard rotation one with number five hitting a uh, red, number eight, uh, Courtney, who you mentioned earlier, is hitting a, a, uh, a go. But I noticed that sometimes you go into, um, sometimes you uh, go into a row one that looks like this where you have number eight coming around to hit a red and number five coming around to hit a go. So can you talk about what you like about this and how how do you decide which of those two formations you're going to run? I guess another thing we're looking at here is just two passers in this formation. Yeah, so we, we actually, this was like a season-long um, debate, and we actually had a stack in there at one point, and we like starting in rotation one. Um, I know there's some controversy with rotation one, but we like starting with it just because we get more of our best players in the front row, and we really like the serving order that we get from that. Um, and so we did uh, this one, um, depending on really on our sub situation. Uh, and Cam, number five, is a really good right side attacker. She played right side uh, at her previous school. Um, and so you know, this also allowed our best passer, our libero Emmy, to be able to be in the middle and take more of both seams. Uh, when we would go into the second rotation is, you know, you either had a sub, we had another DS in there. Um, it was a, a sub issue, but mainly if we were just struggling to pass, we wanted our out of system attackers to be in their zones. So Courtney was just so much better out of system uh, in zone two and Cam was better in, in zone four as well. Dan, I'm going to ask you another question about this formation. Courtney and I were watching this a couple months ago and notice your setters here kind of take a head start as the server is serving. And we hadn't seen that a lot before. Can you tell me what you like about that? You see Rachel here, number 10, kind of starts. (laughs) You know, I I think that's that's how I was trained uh, 20 years ago. I I think... uh, you know, like we, we want them moving fast on contact and then, you know, slowing down and being balanced uh, right around when it's at the passer's arm. So just uh, just a chance to get a little bit closer to the net. Hey, Kellen, can you uh, can you address this one? How is the passing stats when there's only two rotations? Do you notice much of a difference there Two passers versus three? Uh, no, we didn't. Um, you know, Valeria wasn't. Oh, well, yes and no. Valeria wasn't a- as able to handle a two-person serve receive as well as some of our other players. And so we we kind of did that when we had to. Um, and we so we would start in a three-passer, and then we would just go to a two-passer if we if we were struggling. We'd usually make that call, um, you know, after a play or two. Uh, so, but when we had a, if we, we would start in that row, and then the next time around, one of our DSs would be in for Cam in that rotation. So we just felt a lot more comfortable. And then we had our two best passers at the time in the tournament, and, and they were able to handle it pretty well. The, the other thing I'll add to that is um, if you're typically – what we've seen is if we're typically in a three and go into like one rotation where we're in a two-passer, the passers 
can kind of handle it. But if you're always in a two passer, I think the overtime grind tends to take its toll. Ah, good point. Okay, let's look at rotation two now, and then we'll watch some rotation two film. But this this is just a very traditional rotation two at the middle, uh, shuffling to her left and hitting a, a quick or a middle attack, and then the opposite kind of uh, shuffling back and then hitting an opposite. But I also noticed um, a handful of times you you went into a rotation two that looked like this, where instead of your opposite and middle, um, in that traditional spot, we have now our middle kind of running along the net to hit a, a quick attack, and then the opposite's already there. So, Dan, how'd you come up with this one? This is another one that we don't see very often, and what do you like about it? Yeah, if you ask the the players, they always want to go in the traditional form. Um, the, the problem is, you know, with a zone one serve, it's pretty easy to make it you can take out the middle pretty easily and so with with the second option you know we found that we're able and serena was obviously a very strong attacker so passes that are a little bit off the net we're still able to get to the middle so um it just jams up our offense a little less how much time do you spend working on both of these like how do you how do you make sure that when you're in the clutch match, the athletes are ready for both options. Um, not, not very much. <laughs> um, and for the most part, you, you know, because these are experienced players, you do it once or twice. But there's been a few times that we've been on the bench and kind of as coaches said, yeah, maybe we, we should have repped that out a few more. But <laughs> <laughs> So last year we had the middle starting at the net the whole time because we just knew we would get a better approaches. And this year we kind of went away from it. And then as we were going in the tournament, we noticed uh, and a lot of teams were serving cross court at Valeria in that row, but then teams started targeting zone one against us. And we we're like, hey, we need another option so we can get our middles involved. Okay, and uh, as we watch row three, we'll see um, just another traditional row three. Uh, you already mentioned Courtney, a transfer. Uh, first team all american she's gonna get a kill right here um kellen what what made her so good i was i was talking to a, a an opposing coach of yours and he said number eight just really really good really good player what what kind of things did you see uh this year with her that that made her such a special athlete you know we were uh talking to a transfer from the big 10 and she was telling us about how when they played iowa the scouting report was literally only courtney bazario and so she had four years of you know two or three blockers on her at all time and then all of a sudden she you know, has a little bit stronger setting she has serena gray next to her for two rotations and um and she's able she was able to have just a little bit more opening but she's also just a player that um you know, she's six, six. She wants is the only player we've ever had that want to be listed and then shorter. And she's just able to hit at a high point really consistently. And so she had great vision on the block. And, uh, you know, she could really wear you down with her contact point over time and, and the range of what she was able to hit. So she was a hard player to defend. You know, she had it all. And, um, and so we were just uh, able to get her in some good situations. And we kind of predicted she'd be able to hit over 300 for the first time in her career uh, with us, just with our system. And, She's able to do that. You, you know, guys I'll, had six. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'll add to that. Like, really, the things we helped her with were blocking. That 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 improved a lot. Um, zone four improved a little bit, but but mostly, I think she was, you know, maybe before had a feeling like I need to kill every ball, and maybe made some more errors. But you know, we had once she kind of bought into like, hey, I'm attacking the court all the time, even if I get blocked. She just was constantly able to put pressure on the other team. She gave other teams very few breaks. Mike, you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to point out you guys have had some small pin hitters and you've had some big pin hitters and both are pretty were pretty great for you guys. And so uh, for those that are listening, we, we sit, talk about this a ton, but uh, maybe we should care less about how tall people are and more about just their game. And uh, certainly Pitt has uh, 
<laughs> done a nice job with that and had players of all sizes come in and have pretty big impacts on your program. So, Okay, let's get into the meat and potatoes of, uh, of, of what we want to talk about over the next few minutes. Uh, your 6-2 offense, so uh, we watched row one, row two, row three. Now when we go into row four, um, what we saw a lot was uh, you, you turned into a 6-2 offense. So number 10 became a hitter. Rachel Fairbanks and number one came in and set as a back row player. So uh, like we saw, I mean, the majority of people watching this show right now uh, commented that they're running six, two offenses. We don't see it um, a ton at elite NCAA women's volleyball, but Dan, it's been awesome to see you do it two years in a row and get to the final four. Um, but I think one of the questions that we have, and it comes up to Mike and I, when we're, at clinics and camps is uh, what do we need to see from two different centers and from all the personnel to help us make that decision? Are we going to do a five, one, are we going to do a six, two? What, uh, what kind of factors go into that decision before season starts or as the season's going, as you're trying to perfect things? Well, multiple, and this year was one of the harder ones because as the season went, I mean, Courtney was really good from the back row um so but in general you have to have two good setters i mean that's and you have to have two good right sides um and you know back to what mike was saying you know us having players of different sizes um you know historically when we had lexus's sister kamalani playing for us you know it was almost a non-block at the net. And so what we're trying to do is not have bad rotations. And most teams that run a 5-1, unless they have a dominant back row player, a great slide hitter, they end up with rotations where all they do is set zone four. And so um, we're not married by any means to a 6-2, um, but we don't want to have rotations where we sit on the sideline as coaches and feel like there's nothing we can do. <laughs> we're that we're just we're going to watch a zone four and do a double block over and over again. Um, so this year it really came down to, you know, Lexus's defense was better a lot than Courtney Bazaria's defense. The setting, let's say, it was close or a wash between the two. So then you have the better defense and you have is Rachel's hitting from the front row better than Courtney's from the back row. And so those were kind of the main you know, thoughts that went went into it. And this year was hard. We, we could have won with a lot of different lineups. So it wasn't like just, it wasn't self-evident that this was always the best. Um, but um, I guess it got us to a final four. Yeah, I think, you know, I guess call it generic, my generic answer when people are wondering should I run a six, two or not? And the first thing, if you have no information, like where do I start, right? What information do I need to gather if I'm a high school coach or a club coach or a college coach? And, uh, and, and you said you have to have two good setters and, and I, I guess how, how, do, how are you guys determining that? How are you tracking that if at all? Um, and, and how much, I guess, wiggle room are you going to allow when one setter might be a little better or worse than the other. Um, it, there's probably not one clean answer there, but um, certainly there has to be a certain level of competence from both setters before we can even begin to dive into this type of a system. And, and what is that level? You want to take that, Kellen, or me? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at our setters and uh you know in practice and in games and rotations and we we, we spell you know what is their what is their, what are their numbers in first ball what are, what are their numbers in trans what are their numbers with each player on each set and um you know this is something that we're constantly looking at in preseason, and you know and then it, we're constantly looking at it in uh you know, throughout the year and just reevaluating what is the best. And there were times where we were discussing, hey, would a 5-1 be better? And, or should we just go to it every once in a while um, if we're in trouble? And, uh, you know, it's that balancing act. And, you know, the um, if, if there is a disparity, we're not just going based off the numbers. Like, obviously, Rachel's numbers with Courtney were a little bit better. You know, like, so we had, or Serena was a little bit hitting a little bit higher percentage than 
Um, and so we do take that consider into consideration. Um, but, you know, this upcoming year, we'll have three setters on our roster and we'll start with uh, Joe Trenzi's model of, you know, the location predicting the, um, you know, the hitting efficiency too. And so we're just, it's a constant thing that we're looking at because we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're making the right decisions and it's not just our feelings as well. Yeah, it's a complicated formula. So for all, the, for all of you listening out there, you know, I think there's two, I call them two big ticket items you have to start with and that's your setters, are they reasonably close? Um, Kellen mentioned setter by hitter. What that means is, um, do you have the resources in your gym it, it, to do this, to keep track of this? If you do, please, we recommend it. But, you know, track your hitters by setter. And you might find some stuff there. Uh, one hitter might play better with another setter uh, and so on. And then the, the second big thing here we're looking at is, do you have a, a legitimate back row option that Dan talked about? And so I think as a starting point, um, that's that's where you can begin in terms of figuring out if this is good for your team. And please um, dive into some of this rather than saying, oh, well, we get more playing time. We understand that. And certainly uh, that's the world that we live in in club volleyball. Playing time matters. So we don't want to devalue that part of it. But um, but we have to uh, get these other two pieces of the puzzle in there before you just dive right into uh, a 6-2 for the sake of playing time. So that's what I would uh, I guess, recommend for those of you considering this. I'll, I'll jump in on that because that, that actually is a factor for us too, Mike. I mean, you say we say we do run a 6-2 um, next year and say a freshman is the second right side. Okay, and they're not in, you know, they're not used to, it's a lesser role than, you know, maybe they had in high school, but it, it's still a role and it matters. Yep. And then maybe the next year they're the first, then maybe they transition to being a six row outside, but there's still a, um, there's more people on your team that are, that are part of the deal. So that is a factor. The other thing I'll say about one add on to sometimes a six, two can be better if setter because it's not just about setters being equal. Sometimes a setter connects better with a certain middle or a certain right side. So you can actually go, hey, we're going to put this middle two rotations with the setter she's better with then. And so you, it can be a game you know, if you yep. if you mix and match the rotations by who they're good with. Awesome. Put your, um, Dan, kind of following along those same lines, put your high school coaching shoes on. <laughs> yep. And uh, we don't have 20 hours a week with the girls all throughout the winter and spring. How how can high school coaches figure some of this stuff out in a in a quick way or in maybe a more simple way? Well, the the first thing I would and I and I know gold medal squared coaches will agree would be to make your your static stretching and jogging in circles warm ups as slow as possible and get on the ball faster. <laughs> Um, you know, because if you 15 minutes a day, the, you spend in in warm ups, that adds up to the on the week and the month, a lot of hours. And so get them over the net, get them in the butterflies and the, and the stuff where you, everyone's doing everything. They're training the whole game as soon as possible. Um, because really, that's the kind of the story with how we ended up having Rachel hit. And I can tell you this, we didn't we recruited her as a setter. We she did run a six two. For T Street, um, when she was in high school, we saw she was a good hitter, but we just thought she was too low. And um, at one point, she told us she touched 10 feet in high school. We didn't believe her. And and so then she got here. She was strength training. She was behind two older setters. And about halfway through her freshman year, she touched 10, three and a half in the weight room. And uh, so we just started putting her in drills uh, as a hitter more. And at first she was kind of mad at us. She's like, you don't think I'm a good enough setter? I said, well, um, that's not true. I just want to see if you can do it as a hitter. And then as the season progressed, she ended up doing both for us her freshman year. But, um, but yeah, I just thought I'd share that story. <laughs> and it led perfectly into one of the questions I was just going to ask as I throw this graphic up. Um, a really good all-around player clearly statistically and she was an all-american player and and uh and she helped lead you guys to the final four two straight years how do you because because this is where i would find uh the biggest complication with a six two 
with one of those setters also as a hitter. How do you get her enough reps in everything that she needs to get reps at, Kellen? Well, if you ask her, she's not getting enough reps at, at either. You know, she wants more. <laughs> and, um, you know, we just do our best. And so if we're doing, a, you know, even something as simple as a butterfly, we'll make sure we leave time where she's getting the same amount of swings as the other people or we're just flipping the sweater, the setters around. And, and so, uh, you know, and then the six on six drills will, you know, what's actually interesting about our team last year that we did a lot was, you know, we brought in two one-year transfers, Cam Ennis, as an outside hitter, but she was actually a setter at Kansas her first two years. And then we brought Courtney Bezzario, who at Iowa set her first year as well. And so we'd have them set too. And so we would run true six twos where both of them were setting and hitting. And so we were able to figure out ways within the drills that we were doing to, to make sure Rachel was getting um, or the rest we wanted. And, you know, there were some rotations where the other girls were setting, which actually ended up helping us. And, and you saw it at the BYU game, you know, Cam was setting for us at that point. Um, and so, yeah, we just try and do our best to, to manage it, but, um, you know, it's not a, that we don't have a perfect formula for it. Dan high school shoes on again, before we, we go into maybe a ninth grade tryout and we were seeing girls for the first time and, and, uh, Although maybe ninth grade isn't a great example anymore because girls start playing a lot earlier now, but um, they're playing for the first time. How how do you suggest a coach decides what position or positions an athlete should should be playing? Um, I think you know in the the hard part with you know, is the balance between developing and I have a game in a week, you know, like you're seeing, you see this girl, you want her to be the outside or you see like you get it stuck in your mind as a coach that this is going to be our middle or this is going to be our setter. And then sometimes you kind of lose sight of the fact of, Hey, what are they really good at right now? And so uh, John price at Cal state Northridge was, was my college coach and something he would always pride himself and we've talked about it was um you know he would just at some point in the preseason you know toss a bunch of balls in the middle for everyone and just see what it looked like everyone hit in the middle too or just kind of hey you hit like just do stuff where and kind of then the light bulb will go off of oh hey you look pretty good on an x or you hey you actually hit a pipe pretty well or just you know, like, hey, you step in and, and set this round of correction or, you know, just to do things early on where you um, and you just kind of make these mental notes of, hey, this is something you're already successful at. Because I think it's nice for a younger athlete, because, of course, a ninth grader has tons to get better at. But if you can find something they're already good at, I think that's uh, you start from there. A little ecological dynamics 20 years ago. I like it. <laughs> uh. Okay. Um, speaking of uh, speaking of tossing balls to middle attackers as young coaches, um, I've been impressed with your middle attack as I've watched it over the past couple of years. And uh, so we're going to watch some of that. But um, Kellen, just what's what's some of the middle attack philosophy kind of in terms of tempo, in terms of frequency? in terms of how how effective it needs to be in order to open up other parts of your offense? Yeah, I mean, our, our philosophy is to run a zero tempo. Um, and so we want our hitters on their third step or in the air when the setter has the ball uh, in her hands. And, and that's what we're shooting for. And then, you know, in terms of getting the, the middles of the ball, we train a lot, just like you saw there of, you know, we train a lot of spacing. So what I mean by that is, you know, the further – off the net, the, the setter goes, the more we want our middle to shift over, looks more like a 31. And, and so we just want, you know, up until 10, 11 feet, we still want to be able to get the ball to our middles. There were two of our stronger attackers this year. Uh, they both get hit both ways. And they actually both got better at it as the year went on. And, um, and then, you know, in terms of, and so we just want to make sure we're getting involved when we can. And then there's just a consideration of what's the matchup in the scouting report that we're trying to exploit. And, um, you know, we run a fairly simple offense. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of play sets. It's red three go or red one go and we throw in some pushes here and there. 
Um, but you know, we uh, and so we look at the scouting report and say, hey, like we're 31 is not a good idea with Ico Jones in the front row, or you know, so let's run more quicks or more pushes. And so then, uh, but you know, we love running our middles, and it's fun to watch, and they're good players, and they have. Um, and it's fun for the fans, and so we, it's really effective. So we want to get them the ball as much as they can. It, as I'm watching this, and I'm reminded of how low we pass <laughs> and, and how we were never actually or very rarely actually on our third step or in the air. The other thing we train our setters is when the pass is low, to just hang it a little bit higher because that is uh, you know, a good middle that is still a very easy ball to score on. Dan, so, I was are, gonna, that's a good segue because I was going to ask you that question because there are times when I notice you guys hang a ball a little higher. Uh, and now, now that you mentioned that a couple times in here, they were faster passes, but also maybe more so last year. I don't know. You guys can tell me, but um, it seemed like there was a few audibles that were going on, medium pass situations where some of your best attackers are in the middle of the court and you set them, you know, you're at 10, 12 feet and you set them some balls that were almost a two ball. Um, and I'm assuming this is intentional. You're just building a system around some good hitters on your team. And, um, and so you guys do have some audibles in place to slow things down in the middle. It looks like to me. We, we, we do, um, every year we've messed around with some fixed point, higher sets with mixed results. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just I don't know if we didn't work on it enough or just the middles we have didn't didn't always latch on to it enough. Or they just seem to more likely be able to scream I'm out then uh, but it also I think a, a factor for that is um, how strong your pipe hitter is because if all of a sudden you like your middles yelling for a high ball in the middle then it kind of gets a little wonky with your back row. And so I, we felt like our, you know, our, with especially with Juliana being six five for most of the year, we felt like our pipes were a little bit better. So we, we this year we tried to stay a little bit more with the, with always being close to zero tempo in front in, with the middles. Um, slides though, Kellen didn't really get into slides. We have had slides are a little bit more for us almost like um, the way we talk about setting the pin. We've had years we set the slide really fast, and we've you know we had a Canadian who's on the national team a couple of years ago. We set a really slow slide, and she was very effective. So that one is a little bit more, um, you know, we just we try to put the the hitter in a good spot. My God, one more thing, um, you know, we'll do this would be good for the high school audience too. We'll do you know drill where it's middle versus middle. It's a matchup. They're the only person that can score. And so when you get into those transition plays, I mean, you can't run a quick tempo. So we will throw up a high ball in the middle. And, and so we're not, it's not like when that stuff happens, it's not like it's just, you know, we do, there is some ecological element to it, if you will, where they just need to find out a way to, to be able to score against a triple block in trans. And, um, or it's just a bunch of back row players, a setter in the middle, and they're the only person that can attack and w without, with only one other blocker. And so, we do put them in a lot of situations where they have to get creative to be able to score. Awesome. Dan, Dan I want to go back to what you said about the, the pass height. Is that something that you guys are, are coaching in terms of, uh, is there an ideal height an ideal hang time that you want those passes to be in the air? Uh, not an ideal, um, not an ideal height. We, I mean, height we'd rather have it higher, but, I just think it's uh, it's we have have had more success when the ball's outside of our midline, you know, overdoing the angle rather than underdoing it. And then, um, as, Wait, can, you, uh, can no. you? So you're talking about you've had more success getting more height on the ball overdoing no, it? No, passing lower, like so, just tilting, like over tilting outside your body line rather than underdoing it which tends to end up in the back wall. I, I got it. Yeah, so we, we'd rather have them try to be really drive it. Yep. But every passer is a little different, but in general, that's, we've, we've found more success with, you know, passing a little lower outside of body line. I'm gonna throw this up. I made this, uh, I made this graphic about 
10 months ago. So we're looking at the final two matches of last year, 2021. And this is where your setters were. Uh, of course, you see Pitt there on the left side of that graphic. This is where your setters were when you set middle attack in those final two matches. And um, I showed this because we were doing a live show with Rob and Jason from St. Mary's in Arkansas. And uh, and they saw that Pitt graphic and said, the passing the passing is good. I think if they can run the middle that much from that kind of that perfect target pass. Um, but Kellen, you, you talked about a little bit. How much are you emphasizing or trying to set middle when you're not kind of in that perfect pocket or that perfect pass pocket and how can, how was can this first fall or trans too? This was all, this was all middle attacks and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, include if it was a kill or an error or if it got dug or blocked, it's just all the times that you set middle in those final two matches. So this would have been your, your, Elite Eight and your Final Four match last year? I mean, I think we would prefer not to run in the dead middle of the court a lot of times. You know, if you're running a quick and you have a good middle blocker on the other side, I mean, a lot of teams defended us the same way, where they'd be in a, just like following our middle in a front. And, um, you know, some of the middles, and this is something we would scout, would be like really good, you know, uh, from a front read and, and being able to block our middles. And so ideally we'd um, like it – further along the net or further off. Um, and, uh, you know, but this, this year we're, you know, with Rachel being the size that she is, we were able to pass a little bit tighter than maybe years past and we've had some smaller setters. And so that obviously helped a little bit as well. Um, but, uh, you know, so, and then, you know, if the scouting report says get them the ball and they're two of our best attackers, we'll do it <laughs> in any situation too. So, um, I don't know if it was a point of emphasis, uh, it actually was a point of not emphasis to do it when you're in the dead middle of the court. Yeah. Sometimes but it just happens. One Dan, thing we, how do you, Dave, how I do you like coaching your, Oh yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Um, so I've been operating on a somewhat of a false, or I've been talking about something at a clinic that I've learned recently that is inaccurate in terms of women's blockers moving to their right. Uh, and, and our ability to set them when we block to our right. And of course we block to our right a lot because we're defending the left side attacker. Um, and I think this concept in my mind came from maybe a little bit of the men's game. Um, but we looked at the data and in the women's game, we're actually setting our middle blockers quite a bit when we move to the right, uh, more than in the men's game. And so I'm just wondering, we talk about this at the clinic, at our clinics a bunch and uh, it'd be nice to get your guys' perspective. Have you had to build any specific systems around, okay, our middle blockers over here now? And how can we get them more sets in that situation? Or have you basically just kind of done your thing and run the offense? This is probably some, this isn't so specific to out, out, out of right side or left, but, um, you know, a, a couple years ago, you, you know, there's more a couple, but USA volleyball got just really obsessed with transing and I just started doing studies on my own of, okay, how many times when someone tattoos a ball in men's or women's volleyball, can we really get the ball to the middle? Yeah. And yet, and, and we're yelling at the middle to trans. <laughs> and I go, how many times is there an overpass that if they weren't transing, they could have just turned and jousted or blocked? And, or how many times did the, did the ball go right to them, but they were running somewhere? And so we feel like we actually train our middles to not trans every single time the balls hit hard. So they, their job is to turn and find the ball and they, and then they make a decision. Um, when it's a, when it's a controlled touch or a fifth and also on tips too, if, if there's a tip and someone's pancaking, they just need to like find the ball and chill. But if it's a, like a 50 to 75% swing, we expect our, our, you know, our ball control to be good enough to, you know, to, to put that to five feet. And so they, they need to turn and run on those. So we have, we just have a little bit of a, a different system than most. Cause I just don't, I just hate being on the court and seeing a perfect dig that in the middle is running away from it and the setters. And also part of that is when you have two back row setters, you know, you don't have that front row setter that can turn and get that tight dig or, yep. um, and, and so that's kind of how we've been looking at it is just, they have to make a decision based on, you know, how tough a swing it was. 
So I'm a middle blocker. I go block right or whatever left, and I come down and I turn around, and my job job number one is evaluate the play. Is that is that? Well, I just see someone cranked it. I'm just turning and finding it. Okay. Okay. I see someone did a 50% swing. I'm turning and running. You know, I or I think I got a controlled touch. I'm turning and running. You know, like they're just. But when in doubt, in transition, I want our middles not running somewhere, like like with you without knowing where the ball is. I just want them finding the ball and making a good decision. And with some training and practice and all that, you found that there's enough time for them to do that, just to come down, evaluate the situation, and go make a choice. And not always. Sometimes it takes them out. Yeah. You know, but but a lot of times we save a point, you know, by that they're able to step in and set or they're able to, like, what would have been an overpass, they turn and block it. Yeah. Um, and of course, the answer is not always if we always turn and run also, right? So, I mean, <laughs> right. Uh, I like, cool. Thanks for that. That's a different perspective. All right. Let's switch gears to another part of, um, of what helped you guys a lot. So I spoke with an opposing coach. I also have been communicating a little bit with your SID over there at Pitt um, as I've prepped for this show. And both of them told me that Pitt is a very good team at covering your attackers. And it's something that uh, it's hard to stat, but via the magic of volumetrics, I was able to um, to come up with some cover stats. And uh, among all the teams that made the Elite Eight, uh, you successfully covered 71% of your opposition's blocks. So every time you hit a ball and a block sent it back over, you covered those balls successfully 71% of the time and you won 25 of those rallies. And um, so hey, you see this Louisville, question comes... You can see Louisville's right there with us. <laughs> this question comes up sometimes. Um how do you cover? Is it a mentality thing? Is it a where are you on the court thing? Is it a how are you positioned? What is the what is the uh, the just what does all that look like, Kellen? How do you how do you help Pitt become a good cover team? So much so that it's actually something that opposing coaches and sports information directors are noticing and talking about. Well, this sounds like intellectual property that we shouldn't be talking about on public <laughs> public media here. Yeah. I, well, I, I want, um, you know, I'll, I'll start and then, you know, Dan and I can work on this together. Uh, but we didn't see the stats. So it's pretty cool. We didn't actually know that until today. Um, but, you know, it start the covering starts with you know, how we play offense. And, you know, we're not afraid to go after the block. And so when that's what, all you're doing all the time is you're hitting um, high and hard into the block or sometimes low and hard into the block. You get a lot of practice every day in the gym covering. OK. And um, and so I do think it actually starts with our offense. And then it's uh, and I'll let Dan speak to this a little bit more. But then it just it's something that, um, you know, typically. When the team when you start to see the effort slip, that's the first thing to go. And so it's something that we're always mindful of. And in terms of like the how the specifics, how we do it, I'll let Dan jump in here. Uh, but I would say that's how it starts. Yeah, I think it comes from. You know, my belief from this comes from me playing at a, at a pretty high level. And, you know, what, like on the AVP, when you see how many balls get covered by one player, um, you know, or international men's volleyball where, where the balls hit even harder, like how many balls get covered. And then you go, you know, for me, the first, my first, you know, real experience after as a head coach, I was at San Francisco for two years, but was at an NAI level. My thought was, you know, there's hardly a ball we shouldn't cover. And um, and so we look at covering, you know, as an effort play. And we look at it as, you know, we stole this from the from Russ Rose, the if you love her, cover. <laughs> you know, that we still, you know, so we have, we think it's uh you're a great teammate by doing it. It's not a, something that shows up in the stat book. It's part of our system. Um, you know, girls that come from other programs always want to ask where they should stand. And I say, and I, we always tell them, you know, there is on a high ball out of system. We do have some places we put them, but in system when we're running a pipe and it's a mess, there's, there's no system. 
You know, it's like everyone get it, get low as you possibly can and look at the blocker's hands and expect the ball. Um, and so the, you know, so, but we, we're very, you know, we're, we're pretty easy coaches to play for. We're, <laughs> we're very enthusiastic. We celebrate with our players, you know, but we're not fun to play for when there's lack of effort plays, you know, when like he's, but like, and so we look at it the same way as a, a tip dropping and no one goes for it. So we, you know, those are, those are just standards of our gym that are non-negotiables. So in system, go find space, <clears throat> make a play. Um, out of system, uh, can you give us a real brief? Yeah, overview? well, in system, I wouldn't just say go find space. Most balls are blocked right underneath the, you know, we, we want to, we, and we ideally don't want to still be crashing at, at the time the, um, and we even train, like you see it a lot internationally, we, we'll train middles to drop knee just to get really, really low. And that's something that I, I think helps, um, you know, especially if you're tall, if you're, as, I'm six, six. And when I'm on a women's net standing straight up, there's not a lot of response time. I <laughs> like the ball off the block to hit the floor. So getting low and, and being underneath the block is the main thing, but we obviously don't want two people in the covering the same zone. Yeah. So yeah, if you see someone already there sliding into a different spot. And this is um, the sweet spot, right? Kind of this. That yeah, the zone at right around, you know, underneath is, is our priority. And and then on an obvious ball out of system, you know, probably the furthest person away would go a little bit more out of circle. Um, but but mostly it's just a whole team of, of play. And we train covering ourselves too. You know, like we with six players yeah. on the court that think the ball is going to come to them. Yep. Yep. And a part of this, of course, is being OK, going after the block, like you guys previously said. And I think I've always felt like one area that we've been behind in, in, in the United States, I think we've caught up a little bit, is just hitter creativity mm -hmm. and the willingness to do that, right, to recycle a ball. We've been working on that a ton on the national team. We've gotten better at it. But um, for those of you listening, you know, we have to train this in our gym. We have to allow our athletes to go learn what it feels like to attack a block and, and cover yourself or recycle a ball intentionally, not on accident, but I'm in trouble right now. I'm going to hit that ball into the block and I know that someone's going to be there to cover me um, or whatever. And so I just want to throw that in hitter creativity, um, intentional swings into the block. We call it recycling. These are all things we should be working on at most levels. Um, not my daughter who's eight, but you know, probably <laughs> starting at 14 or something like that. Uh, we can, you know, start talking about some of this stuff. And of course, if we get good at that and we work on that, we're going to get better at covering. And so, um, yeah, love that. I'll, I'll tell you a little story to reinforce that, Mike. Yeah. If you want so, so two years ago, I have this conversation with Karch, and he gives me a drill that the national team has been doing. You know, just he's like, hey, two minutes a day, three minutes, just this quick drill. And um, and so in our gym, we, we don't actually we talk more about developing than learning. Like, because a lot of people talk about learning, but like, it's like, okay, well, how does that, you say you're learning, but are you, is it like, are you doing it in the game? And so we had this, uh, our outside Lekator, um, we spent no more than three practices before with this, this next game we had. And so we were practicing like tapping and covering, like wiping off the block. Um, and it was three days in a row for two minutes. So let's say a total of six minutes of training. And we go to the next game and halfway through the first set, she gets a tight ball where before she might've tried something weird, she goes and wipes it out point, And then she points to the bench. It's like, huh? Th well, thanks Karch. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, like, it was like that was a, a years of me talking about doing that. And like, and just where I should have shut up and just created a scenario where they're training it. Yeah. <laughs> but That's I have two more six minutes. <laughs> I have two more things I want to add on this for uh, the wide ranging audience we have. One is um, if you feel like your team's in a good spot and stopped and balanced, you should have a coach looking at what, seeing what they're looking at when they're covering. A lot of players look too much at the set and the hitter and they need to be looking at the blogger's hands. And so if you're figuring out why uh, you're struggling, that might be part of it. But the other thing, I just, I don't know this to be true, but I think it is. But um, we were doing, 
and I think recovery made a big jump this past season. We were doing that work, you know, the two minutes a day. And at one point, Dan was just like, okay, let's see how many tapping covers we can get in a row. And we're just going to keep going and going until the ball's dead. And so it was just, a, it wasn't just a self cover. We had a, a setter and a, and which is usually a coach um, and a libero there covering too. And sometimes we would get like five or six tapping covers in a row. And I think that was part of the reason our, we made a jump in the tournament with our covering as well. So, um, so it was like a fun kind of like ladder you could go through to see how high you could get. And I know there is a certain skill level you need to have to be able to do that, but it could be some fun to experiment with. It's awesome. Dan, that was one of the better little nuggets I've heard in a long time. Developing, not learning. I'm going to steal that from you if you don't mind. And, uh, uh, you just give me credit. Yeah, I'll put it <laughs> down at the bottom. But, uh, you know, everyone learning, the, the word learning is, I always I think it's a little trendy. And, um, and whenever things become buzzwords, they kind of start losing their meaning. Yeah, everyone everyone says they're a good learner until you ask them to make a change. That's my, that's my saying. <laughs> and so... Uh, I like that developing. Another thing that uh, that some of these coaches and your SID mentioned was your serving, and specifically um, as we look there, kind of at your error percentage and your ace to error ratio. Uh, the only Power Five team, I believe, in the country to have a positive ace to error ratio. I coached at St. Mary's with Rob Browning, and I can hear him just cheering right now uh, at that ace to error ratio because he loves that. Um, what are some of the cues? What are some of the, the language that you use when you're training your setters, Kellen, about, about kind of balancing aces, errors, how tough it's not tough enough and, and kind of, how are you training that for your servers? Um, I'll let Dan talk a little bit about the, like how we get there. Um, but you know, we just kind of noticed throughout the season, we weren't missing much, you know, and of course, uh, you know, I heard Jared and Eric talking about other teams having weak links, and you know, that's something we spent a lot of time on. How can we put the other team in that position? But we just had a group this year that served in a lot, and um, you know, there were times where you know we we talked about, hey, do we have them serve more aggressively? Which obviously could have potentially increase the amount we were missing. But when you have a team that just makes it all the time, it puts a lot of pressure on the other team. You're not giving them free points. I guess. I just think about how many times it was a crucial moment in the tournament and a team would miss a serve in one of our worst rotations and it would totally let us off the hook. And we just didn't have um, like a lot of that for our opponents this year, which I really think helped us a lot. Um, in terms of the specifics, I'll let Dan talk a little bit about serving. Yeah, well, our serving keys, we've I, I, I'm using Jamie Morris's and so I won't, I won't share those. I'll let him be his, but <laughs> we really don't go over serving keys. We do in the preseason, then we have a few follow-ups throughout the year. But we do, um, it, well, A, our philosophy is, you know, we're not going for aces. We're just, we're trying to make their offense uncomfortable. Okay, so if we can, that's our goal. And if aces happens, you know, we're happy. Um, but we just do a lot of, um, you know, we do a lot of contrasting. And so we do, um, um, but it's not contrasting of like, like, hey, let's just try this. It's like, no, like, hey, you're going to toss the ball too far to your right, and you still are going to serve a perfect floater. You're going to toss the ball too far to your left, and you still need, and you're going to serve a perfect floater. Now you're going to toss it too far in front of you. Now you're the same idea, toss it too far behind you. Now toss it too high still needs to be a flat and clean serve now toss it too low and so in the same way that we talk about like a hitters i just hate hearing a server talk about oh it was my toss so well we need to give you some more reps then on a bad toss <laughs> it's like rather than just like always it's almost like saying oh it's a bad set i can't kill it so we we ha talk a lot about our server a uh, server window um um, but again, like there was an element of luck to it this year because when Juliana got injured and we had to go to, uh, you know, kind of, a you know, a, a DS for one of our outside, uh, cam, you know, it just made our serving better. And so then we just had a rotation where, 
you know, where we had everyone on the court had good command of their serve, um, was pretty low error. And, uh, you know, and then by the time you get into the tournament, you're able to watch so much video and have a good plan for each rotation. But, um, but yeah, this was the best serving team we've ever had. So a couple follow-up questions there. Um, first, are you guys calling serves on every ball? Or most balls? We, or are you guys relying on just the scouting report? I'd say we've evolved into every single time. <laughs> okay. Because a lot of times we have multiple plans by rotation. Yeah. Because we can't control the matchup. And so we like our servers to have one, like ideally two really good serves. Um, so, you know, if their best serve is serving from the right side, we want, you know, we can't, we don't always just tell them, hey, go serve from the left side because it makes the most sense. We'll just try to figure out what our best couple scenarios are based on what the other team struggles with. And it's one, I like that because it's one less thing that you're asking your athletes to have to remember, which yep. as we know, there's a, <clears throat> there's a breaking point when we get too much information. Um, next, and then the next question is when you are calling a serve, obviously you have your plan. Um, if you're, if you've served a couple balls to one girl and it, you're scoring, are you staying on it? I asked, I asked the Texas staff the same question. I'm intrigued by this question. Do you stay on it or do you guys are, you know, if you've scored two points, are you not afraid to say, all right, we're going to go do this now and just, I guess, uh, keep keep the pressure on them? Or are you going to try something else with that with that serving run? I'll let Kellen take this one. Well, usually if we're scoring a few, yeah, we'll start talking about if we want to switch it up or not. And um, so the answer is sometimes, yes, we'll switch it. And other times, uh, no, we'll just keep hammering away at what we're doing. And it's working. Yeah. And and sometimes the plan is uh, a two to one, you know, to be down the line, one cross court. And, you know, hopefully you're getting to that point where you're getting to that one. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll just, it's, a, you know, Dan and I, because I call the serves, but Dan and I are talking about all the time, hey, do we want to, because game flow matters, right? Your plan, start with your plan, but game flow matters. And, um, and so, but I would say the majority of the time we stick with our plan if we keep yeah. scoring. Now we had, oh yeah, good call, Dave. Just real quick, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. But um, do you have an answer for this? What's the goal to stay under for serving error percentage? I wrote a blog a couple years ago looking at what the top 25 teams were doing over a handful of years, and it looked like 9-ish percent is what a lot of teams were missing. You were significantly lower than that this year. Is this something that you have as a goal? Like, is this something you talk about? We want to be under such and such percentage, or do you kind of just see how it plays out throughout the year? Well, we definitely want to be under 10. You know, we don't, we don't want to, I guess we just look at it individually. We, we don't want a, like a server that's over 10. And so if everyone's under 10, usually you end up like, you know, seven or eight. Yeah. Um, so it's more just working with each individual and going, Hey, you're, you know, um, there's just a tendency from some younger servers that they just do the the classic high school thing. I got it in. Now I serve tougher. Now I serve tougher. Now I serve tougher. And they're not even paying attention to how much stress they're putting on the other team. They just want to get that ace. So, you know, kind of helping those players understand, hey, like, even if you backed off a little bit on the fifth, it'd probably be better. You know, they, we'd probably still score the point with how yeah. much it, it's affecting the row. Make them earn it. Yeah. Mike, well, what's, Dan, the team, what's the national team doing with uh, sticking with the plan versus switching it up? We've had some different things that we've tried. Um, I, I'm i pretty happy if we're scoring, keeping it. Because, you know, our guys have their best serve and, uh, and they have tendencies. And uh, I've found that, you know, for the most part, those tendencies are where we're scoring when they hit their best serve. And uh, so if we're on a we're on a two or three point scoring run, which at our level is rare, but when it happens, I'm happy just keep doing what we're doing. And I, I love the idea of we're not trying to, we're not trying to get an ace. We're trying to get a medium pass or we're trying to, you know, keep the pressure on and make them earn it. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. And uh, I can't tell you the number of times, you know, Taylor Sander, we'll talk about him briefly, but he, 
he's got a little cross court jump serve into, we call it the two seam um, back there and it's his best serve. Um, and then, you know, he'll get two points or two aces in that seam. And then he goes hard wrist away down the line, right into the net. And uh, the amount of times he's missed that serve relative to the amount of times we've actually scored on it. Um, I'm guessing is uh, doesn't pencil out. So yeah, I like, I like just if it's working. Let's keep rolling with it. But certainly there's opinions that would, people would there's people out there that want to have two serves and be have a lot of variety and mix it up and hit roll shots and all the things so uh, certainly no shortage of opinions on that so yeah. all right well dan kellen thank you so much it was an awesome hour everyone out there watching if you want one of these stanley cups throw in hashtag gms plus in the next five seconds and uh we're going to do a drawing and uh, just as we Tell Dan and Kellen, congratulations on another awesome year, and we're excited to see uh, what you do for years to come. And uh, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, once again, a reminder, Kellen we'll be with – Kellen wants one of those Stanley Cups. <laughs> All right. Mike, you can make that happen. Dan, give Kellen my my phone number, and I'll have him one in the mail tomorrow. <laughs> thanks. We'll be uh, back next week with some Louisville coaches. And um, once again, check out goldmedalsquared.com for our – camp schedule and clinic schedule we'd love to have you join us this summer and we're going to do a drawing in uh right now actually so if you if your name pops up here and if you're kellen go ahead and email uh info at goldmetalsquared.com nathan email us info at goldmetalsquared.com and we'll have one of these in the mail we'll get your address and contact info and uh, we'll get that sent out kellen also contact mike Come on in. He, he's good he for his word. Tomorrow. He'll have one out in the mail tomorrow. And <laughs> um, but but seriously, thank you guys so much for your time. Uh, lots of awesome little nuggets there. And uh, yep, I know I learned as a coach, and all of us out there watching have learned and and grown. So thank you yep. guys so much. Yep. Thank, you. thank you. Much appreciated. Right, we'll, thanks for the time. We'll see you next time, everybody.